Um, with that, we're going to dive into our presentation for tonight. Uh, our focus, as you know, is about AI business and how it's evolving with the law. Uh, we're going to take a moment here and we're going to switch machines so we can get ready to go full into that. As we do it, um, I want to introduce the presentation for tonight. Uh, first of all, um, both Bobby Christensen and Jack Horgan have built this presentation. Unfortunately, tonight, Bobby could not make it out due to a personal event that she needed to attend to. We have our contributions in the presentation, and uh, we have Jack, who is an expert in the topic, who will be taking us through the presentation in full. You should know a little bit about him if you didn't get a chance to read his bio. So Jack's right here, um, and Jack has invested his expertise in law in helping clients navigate through complex software technology and IP commercial transactions, and he is working with technology companies on their most critical day-to-day -day functions in their agreement. And so as a result, he's very close and in a trusted role related to companies as they navigate these things. Uh, there is an excellent paragraph here that has a lot of technology things in it. And I think I need to tell you a few of them so you know why you can trust his experience here. So Jack counsels clients on all sides of software technology and IP commercial transactions. He's routinely handling transactions involving artificial intelligence, as well as software licensing, software distribution, development, um, everything that is SaaS, PaaS, our infrastructure as a service, cloud computing, outsourcing, ERP solutions, NFTs, blockchains, all of those things. So we're in very good hands. Um, also, if that's not enough to start a conversation in social hour afterwards, um, Jack did his undergraduate at Notre Dame, in case that's a conversation starter, he's there as a rival or a fan, uh, and worked on his Juris Doctorate here at Creighton University. So with that, I'll hand this over to Jack, and Jack, thanks so much for your presentation. All right, thank you very much, Dennis, for that too kind of introduction. Just a quick short story. So. Dennis is actually my uncle. He married my dad's sister, who's back there, Claire. And this all came about about, a, I don't know, a month and a half ago or so. And Dennis said, hey, we're kind of starting this cool AI group, just a bunch of enthusiasts, people that are interested, experts in it. Um, and he just wanted to meet up and chat about it. And then that's what turned into this. So thank you very much to AI Omaha and Dennis for uh, arranging this and asking me to speak. I'm really looking forward to it. Just a quick agenda, kind of what we're going to run through. What is AI? Quick question for the crowd here. I'm just curious. Who would consider themselves an expert in AI, actual how it works, uh, machine learning, the nuances, and like the data and analysis part of it? So we got one. Who would consider themselves on the total opposite end of the spectrum? They don't know hardly anything about it, but are curious and an enthusiast. Oh, Marlon. I see Marlon's here. Yeah. Awesome. Some more. And I'm guessing some more are probably in the middle somewhere. Got it. And that, that's kind of where I'm at. Obviously, I'm, a, I'm an attorney. I'm not a data scientist. I'm not a coder. But now I've worked with a bunch of clients for probably two to three years now where AI has really become uh, front and center on a lot of different issues. I've had clients describe it to me. At first, when I first started, I was like, tell me like I'm a preschooler. It's like, okay, got that. Tell me like I'm a fifth grader. Got that. Tell me like I'm a high schooler. So I kind of worked my way up to a decent understanding but just, just know I'm not a software coder. There's at least probably one expert here on the technicalities of AI that will, maybe we can ask him some questions as the, as the presentation goes. So we'll kind of run through the basics and get a, a baseline on understanding of AI and machine learning. And then we'll run through some legal issues. And there's really a distinction on the legal issues, really from a user perspective. Are you going to use AI as a potential internal tool to improve your business? to make it more efficient? Or are you actually going to be an AI provider? Are you going to be a company that takes an AI algorithm, builds a model, and commercializes that with customers? Focus will, right now will be on AI users. I consulted with Dennis. That's probably most applicable to us right now, but I will touch on AI providers as well. And the issues, I honestly, tend to be pretty similar. And then, of course, the current and, and future laws, and then maybe some action items afterwards. Here's a warning. There are a lot of questions out there. There are not a lot of concrete answers on the legal issues. So if you want, if you came in wanting a black and white answer, what, what's the answer to X, Y, and Z? Is this copyright infringement? Do I own this? Probably won't get that answer, but we'll be able to spot the issues and provide some guidance on and some ideas where we think this thing might be going. The issues are relatively easy to spot. 
the current legal frameworks, especially the intellectual property rights, haven't really contemplated AI. They, you know, they've been around for a long time. The main ones, copyright, patent, trademark, trade secret. They especially patent and copyright are what most applicable here. They contemplate historically human authorship. So copyright is an expression of idea. Picasso paints a painting. He has a copyright in that painting. You know, back uh, in the early 1900s, they didn't think, well, what if a machine does that? So now we're dealing with those issues and seeing if we can jam those issues into current intellectual property rights frameworks. And then, of course, new case law, laws, regulations, and generally accepted standards will emerge. So that's the part where it's hard to predict. We have some ideas where it's going, um, but no one has a perfect crystal ball. And I'd like to start off, you know, kind of two sides of artificial intelligence. You have this huge benefit and this huge risk of which there's kind of unknowns on each side. Elon Musk himself uh, warns that it could cause the, you know, destruction of civilization. Uh, that was April 17th of this year, July 12th of this year, announces new AI company. So, so uh, everybody knows there's a, there's a lot of risks. There's a lot of things that can go terribly wrong. There's a lot of really great use cases that can really benefit the world and make a much more efficient business. And that's what everyone's grappling with. Business folks, Congress, lawyers, everyone. What is artificial intelligence? Um, no single definition, but if we break it down, what is artificial? That's the easy part of the question, relatively easy. Most people would say that's machines or computer systems. Maybe at some point in the future, there's something else none of us even know about yet that could be artificial. But for the most part, we're talking about computer systems. What is intelligence? This is the hard part. Philosophers have been asking this question for thousands of years. I talk about this for weeks and write a book about it. Generally speaking, people tend to have this sort of idea on what is intelligence. You know, the ability to learn, ability to provide non-deterministic answers. So we'll get into that in a little bit. Traditional software tends to be very deterministic. You put in an input, you get the same exact output every time. Ability to reason, solve problems, you know, plan, look to the future, predict, think abstractly, maybe not just a rote calculation an ability to react to new variables. So putting it all together, AI, the point is as a very broad and general term, it can mean tons of different things. A simple definition would be systems or machines that mimic human intelligence, very broad. So anything in your imagination, the iRobot machines that were not quite there yet, that would be you know, presumably within the AI definition. So my main point is when you're working with AI, especially if you're moving forward from a business perspective, be more specific, actually know what you're getting into. Don't just say, oh, hey, we're doing AI, because that could really mean anything, which brings us to history. We'll run through some of the history. All this goes back really to the, really before when people can imagine things, but really the first uh, instance of modern AI thought was kind of in the 1930s with Alan Turing. Has anybody heard of the Turing test? People know what that is. Basically, Turing had this thought experiment. If you can interact with a machine and it wrote back to you in text, if you couldn't tell the difference between a human and a machine, that's AI. So he had that thought back in the 30s. 50s was the first real use of the word artificial intelligence, actual workshops um, that were at Dartmouth, actual experience, ex excuse me, um, experiments, which led to the 1950s. Uh, the government investment in AI, this is a lot, sometimes people consider this the golden age of AI. Um, there's a lot of advancement in theory and in computational power, which allowed uh, really some, some progress. 1970s and 80s, you'll, he you'll hear the term AI winter. That's, only, that's not only the 70s and 80s. Whenever there's a dip in enthusiasm or a dip in investment for AI, it's referred to as an AI winter. 70s and 80s were a big one. And really the underpinning of the current uh, AI explosion, um, and more specifically machine learning, I'll get to that, is really the 1990s and 2000s. The internet uh, kind of changed the game. I'm sure everyone's kind of heard of the stats. I'm gonna butcher the exact stat, but humans have created the amount of data in the past like 20 years that they didn't create it all in history before that and exponentially more. And really it's, that's one of the reasons why machine learning is so available and making progress this day and it's just the huge huge amount of recorded data so much so that our brains can't even comprehend these data sets that are used to train ai 
and also computing power. So you have the hardware component of as well that a lot of people don't think about. You need a massive, powerful computer to train this data, to create a model, to take in new input data. And that just hasn't been around until somewhat recently. And that's because of those advancements led to the 2010s machine learning, which we'll get to in a little bit more detail. When people refer to AI this day and age in the current context, most of the time they're referring to machine learning or some subset or variant thereof. But so machine learning is a subset of AI, which that's what most people are talking about when they refer to AI. Then you have subsets under that. You have deep learning, you have neural networks, et cetera. And the big day, November 30th, 2022, last November, when the public released a chat GBT by OpenAI, that was kind of the cultural inflection point. Everyone went crazy. Everyone's like, oh my God, this is a brand new technology. And really it's not, but it really become more became more democratized. People can access it. People can interact with it just sitting in their, sitting in their couch watching TV and really leads to where we are today. So machine learning, what is it? Like I said, subset of AI. And it's really computer systems that are able to learn and adapt on data and without following explicit instructions. So that's, that's the key. Old school software programming, you know, you, the coder has to program the function. So it's like, I have this data. I want something to happen. A computer programmer has to sit there and think through what are the steps of this decision tree or what are the steps that I want this piece of software to do? It actually has to sit there and code the entire thing. And that can take days, weeks, months. Machine learning kind of flips that. It's like we have a bunch of data. We have a bunch of input data. We have a bunch of outputs. Let's, let's do some data analysis. If it's uh, supervised learning, let's label this data, pump it into an algorithm, and the algorithm itself will tell us what the function is. So it recognizes the patterns in the data where humans may not be able to do that. So essentially, they just analyze huge amounts of data to determine patterns. In other words, build models and improve as more data is analyzed. So it's a very, very simple example, but traditional software might take the inputs, one, two, 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 six, and the software coder would say, hey, I want to add these together. Let's add them together. Then you, you, the, the output would be what you get from that. So you'd get three, four, eight. In machine learning, that's flipped. You have a bunch of inputs. You have the outputs. Now, this is such a simple function that we all can tell what it is. It's addition, but much more complicated. We, have, we might have no idea why those inputs and outputs are related, but the machine learning would tell us, oh, hey, it's doing this. And then we can pump in new inputs and we get the output based on the function it determines. So just a little bit of an overview. You, know, you have your training data. You plug it into an algorithm. So question, what's an algorithm? And maybe our expert can describe it better than I can. What I've been told is algorithm is kind of the engine behind machine learning. It's a set of procedures on how the data is ran through and builds the model. So it takes a bunch of training data. You run it through the algorithm. It takes a whole bunch of computing power to do this. And you build a model. And the model ends up kind of really being the secret sauce of machine learning in most AI this day and age. It's the mathematical representation of the problem. Then, so that, that's when you're training your model. Then you get to a point, let's say you want to commercialize it, or you want to commercialize it, or you just want to use it internally to improve your business. You already have your model because you went through the first part, or you license it from another party. And you have your input data. You say, hey, you pump it through the model, and it still takes a lot of computing power to do that. And then now I have my output. And again, it's not deterministic. So depending on the weights that that model produces, you might pump the same exact input into an uh, algorithm and data model, and you might not get the same answer because there's probabilities. You probably all mess around with chat GBT. If you say, write me a poem about basketball, you won't get the same exact thing every time. People use chat GBT. So most people know, yeah, yeah. You should try it at home. You know, put the same exact prompt in, you probably won't get the same exact answer. You get something similar. So here's a real world example you can use in machine learning. Hey, we want, to, we want better customer retention. So we take all of our historical sales data, pretend Walmart does this. They would have a lot of data on all of their historical sales. Um, and let's use the ones that, hey, they kind of stopped shopping at some point in time. They, they churned off of us, even though churn is more of a software term. But Walmart, hey, we lost them as a regular customer. 
We don't know why. We don't. We can't identify the variables in the data that lead to that, but we know we have all the sales data. And we know these folks left us. So let's run this data through an algorithm to build the model. The model will have the answer why. It will be able to predict other customers that are likely to churn. So you have new input data, new sales, and like, hey, this this these customers look a lot like those customers that churned earlier because they show X, Y, and Z data points. So that's an example of how it could be used. Here's another example. I did this last night. I just plugged in Stable Diffusion. It's a text to image uh, machine learning program. I just plugged in Nebraska football and style of Van Gogh. This is what it popped in. This is what it popped out. So this program's uh, trained on 5 billion, I believe, labeled images. So they took every Van Gogh image and said, hey, they labeled it as a Van Gogh. The model recognized every single pattern of Van Gogh. So you see the obvious ones there, Starry Night, but you don't see you know, the other ones. You can tell they're in the style of Van Gogh with the brush strokes, but it's not as obvious. So they would study every single parameter of a Van Gogh and attach that to the word Van Gogh. Same with Nebraska football. They're like, okay. And then they mesh the two together. And if you went home and did this, you'd probably get something different pop out. So uh, machine learning expert, is that pretty accurate stuff? Yeah. Okay, there we go. Awesome. Anything to add? Did I miss anything? Oh, I, I, I mean, you know, I'll get more technical ideas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Sounds good. Um, okay, moving on to kind of the legal issues now. And like I said, uh, a critical distinction will be whether or not you're a user or a provider. Again, user being, I'm just using this tool to improve my own business. I'm not not making it available to customers. I'm not licensing it out to customers, just a pure internal user versus being an AI provider. I'm actually want to be an AI company that says, hey, I have this AI tool, you customer, do you want to use it and pay me to access it? We'll hit both of these. We'll focus a little bit more on the issues that are AI users, but as you will see, they tend to overlap and there are a lot of similar considerations. And of course, not only with this distinction, with, with any other distinction with the use case, different uses, there's different risks that come with it. Here's a non-exhaustive, that's very important. There's, a, there's really, it's kind of the wild, wild west as everyone knows. No one really knows every single issue. There will be surprises. There will be things that no one's thought about in five, 10 years. But here is a list of issues certainly that have at least been thought of now. And are known, and in some cases, in some cases, already kind of percolating through the courts. One's the quality of output on a machine learning program. Certain contract restrictions that you need to consider when using it. An AI program, right to disclose inputs. So, in order to use it, whether or not you're an internal user or a customer, you have to insert a bunch of prompts or a bunch of input data to help you solve the problem. Ownership of outputs, that's a huge hot button issue. That's made the news. We'll talk about that. That's probably one you'd be, you're would be you probably most familiar with if you, if you follow it. Infringement and then technical dependencies. So we're kind of going to use this general, very loose hypothetical to illustrate some of the issues. Um, just a raise of uh, uh, hands. Has anybody, has anybody heard of Copilot? It's a, okay, so people are familiar with Copilot. It's an AI software program that can make code writing super efficient. You give it a prompt, and instead of someday someone writes a code that could take them a day, a dozen, in 10 minutes. So very popular, um, very, very already in wide use. So we'll kind of use that as the base example, very high-level example. Um, so we're using that to write code for a new software product. So quality of output, obviously, you'll probably want some human uh, review of the output. I doubt most software companies would just plug that in, use, uh, get whatever output they use, they get from Copilot and just automatically put in their program and don't think about it. Now, software is maybe not the best example for quality of output. We'll get a, another one in a second because a lot of times the program either works or it doesn't. So there's probably a, a natural control there for quality of output on a, uh, on a software program, but it's still an issue you need to think about. Just because it's an AI program or just because it's widely used doesn't mean the output's quality. Um, another case, this one actually made the news. So it's kind of pertinent to lawyers. This guy, 
uh, I don't even know his Stephen Schwartz. He had the great idea. He used ChatGP to dra draft himself a legal brief, didn't review it once, submitted it to the court. Did anybody hear about this? Uh, it was a beautiful brief. You know, the judge was like, oh my God, this is amazing. There was only one problem. The cases were all completely made up. Uh, I think he cited like United Airlines versus, you know, John Smith. It was a fake case. And so the judge was reading, he's like, and then he noticed that he's like, well, what's going on here? <laughs> and the uh, attorney uh, admitted, well, he used a chat GBT to, uh, to draft the brief, didn't review it. So this just shows the risks of AI. Um, they, I think they call it the buzzwords. A lot of times it hallucinates. Like they're really good at processing language, but they can just be dead wrong, even though it sounds very confident. So just don't rely on the quality of output because it's produced by AI or machine learning. <laughs> Another issue to think about is just various different contract restrictions. Um, so in our example, you know, we're using Copilot to, to, to write software for a new product. Well, do we have any customer contracts that specifically prohibit the use of AI? Probably not yet, but I've started to see those because there's some risk averse customers and they say, we don't want you using AI because I don't know if you'll own the IP and that could be a problem for me. So you need to think about that. Um, most customer contracts will require you to own all the IP in into the code of your product or disclose it as third-party code. Um, so that could be really tricky here. We'll get to that in a minute, but it's very unclear. And in fact, the company probably doesn't own the output code. Um, so you know, I want Copilot to draft me the program that adds these columns. I know it'd probably be more sophisticated than that, but as that example, it spits you out code. You probably don't own that code or any rights to that code. Um, similarly, does the AI software provider, you know, they'll all have terms and conditions. You can go to OpenAI, ChatGPT, MidJourney, all of them. They have terms and conditions. Do they put, impose any restrictions on what you can do with the output? very possible. They may not want to get sued for X, Y, and Z reason because they know this is the wild, wild west. So they may say, hey, you can use this. You can use it for fun, whatever, but don't use it in a commercial product. So you need to review those contract restrictions to see if you're allowed to do it. Um, and then in, in uh, the software example, especially, and this actually has, I think, been raised. I believe there's already litigation on this point. Uh, if the Copilot, for example, if they used open source software to train their model, and especially if any of that open source software verbatim makes it into your code that they hand to you, you could have a big problem on your hands, if, especially if it's under a GPL. Do, are people generally familiar with the issues of open source and a GPL license? Maybe not. So open source, uh, that can be a presentation in and of itself. But basically, there's a lot of code out there that's free to use. Anyone can go use it. I, you can go on the internet right now and grab it. But they're licensed under licenses that say, if you use this piece of code, you have to disclose all of your source code to the world that in the program you use it with. So it's very, it's very clever. They, it's called copyleft. They use copyright law to require you to actually disclose your source code. It all originated out in Silicon Valley in the early days. It was kind of a hippie free software movement, but it's become very big. And there's actually a lot of really valuable open source code. Linux, a bunch of programs that are completely open source, but that those certain licenses you have to be really careful of if you're a proprietary licensor and you don't want your source code out to the world. Uh, moving on to right to disclose input. So like I said earlier, in order to interact with these AI machines, you got to input a bunch of data, whether it be a prompt, whether it be code, say, hey, here's my code, how about you tweak it, or whatever data you have. Um, do you have the rights to do that? You know, just because you have possession of it doesn't necessarily mean you have the right to disclose that code. Is this actually your customer's code? Is it somebody else's code? Are you licensing it from a third party strictly for internal use? And they say, hey, don't disclose this to any third party. Now you're pumping it into an AI machine that you're directly violating. So you need to watch out for that. Um, be very careful personal information. There, we'll get to this in a little bit as well. But if you're pumping personal information, even if you consider it yours, if you're a company that has a bunch of sales data and you happen to be sitting on it, but you're like, okay, it would be really great. The example I gave earlier, it would be really great if we know which of these customers would churn and are likely to churn in the next 12 months. You pump all of that data into a 
some third party AI provider, you're going to be, uh, you know, violating a lot of data, data privacy laws, subjecting yourself to a lot of different suits, a lot of different contract breaches. So personal information, just be careful. Um, even if you have the legal rights to input, do you want to? Um, if you're pumping in maybe secret information that you wouldn't want the world to see, probably don't throw it into the AI as an input. Number one, it's likely they could be using that to improve their model, or maybe they're going to use it like, but yet for your competitors. You could be helping your competitors. Two, you could be losing trade secret protection. Uh, trade secrets, uh, intellectual property right, basically any information that you keep secret and derive economic value from. Uh, the most famous one is the Coca-Cola recipe. They keep it in a vault, you know, down a, a mile underground. Nobody in the world knows it except for like three people. They actually have IP protection on that because they keep it secret. So if somebody broke in there and ripped it out, they'd be violating Coca-Cola's trade secret rights. But if you start disclosing that without reasonable protections, not under NDA, you could be losing trade secret protection on your information. Can I ask a question? Yep. Yeah. So my philosophy is, is that if you're using Google AI, Microsoft AI, Whatever you give, are giving to them, and the, according to their terms and conditions, they own it. I think that's a good at working assumption. Rule, I don't, rule, of thumb. rule of thumb. I don't know. If, like they own it might be a bit strong, but yes, I wouldn't. Re- I wouldn't rely on those companies, but yeah. to look out for my best interests. You know, it's like, hey, here's a bunch of information that's secret and confidential. I could be a lot in trouble if you use it for any reason, but helping me. Uh, cross my fingers, please do it. That's not the approach I would take. Yeah. I would probably wouldn't disclose that. Um, if you're doing something like that, you probably want a more detailed, you know, negotiation with them, a contract. Say, hey, this is what I'm doing. I have a use case here, a lot of personal information. And if it's if you're willing to spend the money and they deem it a business, you'd want to have those discussions. Yeah, HIPAA. So. HIPAA would be a big one. Yeah, yeah. you don't. If you're sitting on people's health information. Don't pump that into ChatGPT. <laughs> Uh, relatedly, provi- there we go. Provider use of inputs. You really have no idea what they're going to do with it um, unless you have a negotiated agreement with them that's very strict. Hey, I'm, I'm giving you this information. It's confidential. It's under NDA. You can precisely do X, Y, and Z to improve your model that's specific for me, not your general model that can go benefit my competitors. Etc. So uh, you just hit the nail on the head. It was a perfect lead into my next slide. So this is one of the big hot button issues now that that makes the news: ownership of outputs. So these AI models they obviously pump out outputs. That's the whole point using them. We'll kind of go picture by picture here. Is anybody familiar? With, I guess with any of these pictures, what which one do you guys know? Who has the, the selfie? The, the monkey selfie, yep, yep. So this was a couple of years ago. It's like uh, truth is stranger than fiction. You can't even make this stuff up. So there was, a, I think, like a National Geographic or, uh, guy, a photographer, that was out in the wild taking pictures of monkeys, left his camera on the ground. The monkey picked it up and took this photo. So it's a monkey selfie, literally. The monkey took a selfie of himself. And the guy wanted to claim copyright ownership in it and, and you know, publi- uh, publish it in whatever magazine he was working for. And then here comes along PETA. You got a little PETA. They say, no, actually, the monkey owns the copyright. They, they sued on behalf of the monkey. <laughs> so they say, no, actually, that monkey owns that copyright. So this actually got litigated. It didn't go to the Supreme Court. I think it went all the way to the Ninth uh, Circuit Court of Appeals. And they decided, and the question was, can a monkey be an author under copyright law? And they answered, no, you have to be a human author. So, uh, you know, the, now you can probably, the connection to AI, back then they weren't thinking about AI, but now there's precedent. They decided you have to be a human author. So relatedly, they relied on that case where the picture on the way right is a guy named Thaler. I believe is how you pronounce his last name. It's T-H-A-L-E-R. He's kind of been a pain in the neck for the USPTO or the patents and trademarks and the copyright office because he's been a huge AI proponent. One of these guys that submits all these applications for copyrights and patents because he was on the forefront of AI, built his own AI machine. I don't even know how you're supposed to pronounce it, but it's D-B-A-U-S. He built this AI machine. 
on the early edges that creates all this stuff. So he was one of the first guys that started applying for copyrights and applying for patents. This was the first image on the way right that he applied for copyright. I think I'm going to butcher the name, but it's something like par uh, the last entrance into paradise or something. It's a pretty famous picture, like in just the legal world. And they, the copyright office said, no, you can't copyright. It. And he was up front with them. He said, my AI machine drew this image. I didn't really know. I built the AI. I built the machine learning. I prompted it. And that's what resulted in this photo. And the, AI cop and the copyright office said, no, can't copyright that. You have no copyright protection. On the same theory as the monkey selfie case, the you're not. A, there wasn't a human author at that point. It was the AI that was the author of that photo. So he has no copyright protection on that. Uh, Zara of the Dawn is where you can see where there's gonna eventually be some middle ground at some point. Most people think this is a lot more recent. Um, this individual used AI to, I believe, she wrote. Uh, or mostly wrote the story. It's a comic book. It's about 18 pages. Mostly wrote the story, but AI completely generated the images. So the copyright office said, okay, you can have copyright on the story, on the words, the text, the story, but you can't have copyright on the images. So that's a case where now she has a partial copyright on something that was partially created by AI, but partially created by her as a, as a human. So that's where this is probably going to end up going at some point where there's going to be, if there's some sort of level of human involvement, you can use AI as a tool. You'll probably be able to get some IP protection depending on, uh, you know, it's going to be very fact specific. But if you're using some sort of generative AI, clicking a button, produce me this, you likely won't get IP protection. And again, that's just my prediction. It's there's, all of these cases are going to be litigated. There'll probably be thousands of examples and things won't be settled for a while. But that's where it appears uh, it's heading. So I, so what's the, what's the difference of an AI creating a picture and me, a professional photographer, use, I'm not creating that picture. I'm, taking, I'm using a camera. You're fixing it. The, you know, you're fixing it. That's the kind of the legal word. Yeah, you're not really creating the picture, but you are determining where to point the camera, the color, the time of day. There's your it's your creative expression. And where are we at district level? Like as far as going through the courts? I know the Supreme Court hasn't heard. Uh yeah. So going back, I believe the monkey selfie case went to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, I believe. But everything else is in lower court. Yes, correct. Yeah. Supreme Court. Now Supreme Court did. Has anybody heard of the Go ahead. Yeah, the Supreme Court recently had an Andy Warhol case. I don't know if anyone heard about that. Actually, it wasn't AI related, but a lot of people think it will be related to AI. Um, and it's whether or not, and it gets to the fair use. So we'll talk about that. Uh, so they kind of touched an AI related issue very recently, although it was on infringement, not copyright ability. So the camera case is a good comparison, in my opinion, because it's Everybody owns a camera, but it's like you said, it's specific time of day. You do all of this stuff. What was that called? Did you say um, placement or fix? Fix, fixing. Yeah. But I would say that uh, Tom Craft, right? Uh, there's people who can work with and say the right words, like the magic incantations. And some of the artists call it that magic incantation, and they get to the right images. So I would say that that's. In my opinion, that's on par with the camera settings. I mean, I know that there is plenty of stuff that still has it. Right? Yeah, that's a good example. I haven't heard that's what what'd you call it, cantation? Well, it's they call it prompt craft. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. So prompt prompt crafting, yeah, for AI as a tool. Right. Yes, yeah. Well, I think it's like everybody can click the camera. Yep. Right? But the professionals are the ones that do the stuff. Yep. It's kind of like that, too. I, I, at least from my perspective. Yeah, I agree. I think it, there's going to be a point where you can use generative AI as a tool and prompt it maybe a thousand times to create something, say, hey, create this, you know, tweak this, tweak that, tweak that, and really use it almost like a paintbrush rather than, hey, just do this. Most people think or predict at some point 
Now, at what point is it's like, who's the author is the question from the copyright office's question. Is it the human or is it the AI? Is it the AI program? And when does it cross over from the AI program to the human? That's, I think most people think there will be some case law out there that says, yeah, you used an AI tool, but you had enough of your own creative expression or we'll grant you a copyright. But where that line is, nobody knows. Okay. Yeah. The other thing also is that it's, I see this duration, right? Where you have generated a bunch of images, you play with prompts and stuff, and your, your eye says that this is the right button. This is the hit song, right? Yep. And so not everybody has that eye. So I think that's a little bit of the, uh, the artistic, you know what the right stuff is, and you know how to pursue that further, as far as we express it. But I, I agree, but it gets to the creation point. So if if I was in a studio session like with Taylor Swift and she made something, I'm like, that's a hit song. Like I don't have the copyright in that because I didn't do the creating. So I think that's part of it, but you also have to be the one that actually authors the work. Right. Yeah. Taylor Swift says, I I think this is the song I'm bringing to the studio. I have a bunch of pieces and stuff in there not that. Yep. Or whatever, but I think this is the one. So because it is the prompt crap just like with the with the camera, right? I mean if the camera argument works with that, yep. then this should be of that similar thing. I agree. I don't think it's there yet. And the copyright office and the courts haven't decided that yet. But I agree that's where it's going. It will be a tool that helps create something. Um, but we just haven't had that case yet. In the, in the image on the right. Correct. Yeah. Yes, he definitely has a copyright on. Well, I shouldn't say definitely, um, but he very likely has a copyright on the algorithm and the model, and likely, depending on the details, he may even have patent protection on that as well. But it's the output that he didn't have the copyright protection on. This Verbatim code uh, contains the same copyright protections that a verbatim poem would have, or a uh, uh, piece of writing. Or like, uh, what makes uh, it uh, acceptable to sort of put your own spin on it? Is you put your own words, right? Like you read it, and you trans trans translate it into your own language, and then it becomes yours, right? It's the same with a piece of code, right? If you copy the code and it's literally the same, then you prove like, oh, you've taken this from me. Yep. Uh, and this is an accessory image, and that's the issue, that, right? Like, you can't prove like how it's came about. It's difficult to back to the block prove the lineage of the image, right? Like, that it hasn't been stolen or that it hasn't been. Like, how would we do that? Did, Correct. You're, you're getting a little bit more towards the infringement question, and we're at a little bit more preliminary stage. And is this protectable in the first place? Now, it's very possible that he doesn't have a copyright on this, but let's just, and this is not the case to my knowledge, but let's say he used an image very, very similar to this to train his AI model. There could be a third party say, hey, you're infringing me. Because I had a copyright in a different image, but you basically took that image, you changed three colors, and now you, your AI program produced this. So that third party can come along and maybe sue him for infringement. Even if, and whether or not he has a copyright in this image would be a different question. And when we get to the infringement one, I'm really curious about the chance the AI will produce something that's uh, functionally uh, indecipherable from something that already exists in the world, but not knowing. Meaning, it was never part of its actual subset of data, but it somehow has produced something that is almost, for a human being, inconceptually different than, let's say, something that an artist made that they made money on, and therefore it creates. You gotta really, yeah, there's a lot of, and it's a lot of practical. Yeah. Yeah. Negative, right? Yeah, a lot of theoretical questions in there too. There's the there's the example where if you have a bunch of monkeys writing forever, right. they'll eventually write Shakespeare. You know, so it's it's interesting. Yeah. We're about to prove that. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, the terms of service inside of OpenAI speaks specifically to that, where it says that it does not guarantee that it is unique, does not guarantee that it's right, does not guarantee that it is not completely pirated or. Plagiarizing. Yeah, they disclaim everything and everything. Yes. Yeah, it guarantees, yeah. It guarantees that it is not that. Yep, it's a it's an upside down guarantee, but it is quite possible that it produces a poem and a whole stanza of it is completely lifted and plagiarized from 
something else. And that's why you can't use this to build your own intellectual property. It doesn't guarantee that it's not completely plagiarized. Yeah, very possible. So if you produce, like, a, to your point, a whole paragraph of, from a poem is an output of ChatGPT, let's say. And the, the poet's out, some poet is out there and say, hey, that is exactly what I, that's exactly what I wrote. If they can prove that ChatGBT trained their model and copied it in part of the training, they likely could have an infringement claim. But also you can't use the terms and conditions to think that the, what the, whatever product yes. it is, is capable of that. You know, my coffee maker <laughs> says if it takes over the world, it's not our fault. <laughs> so they like, can't true. just base it, it you know, on that. Just because it's in the terms of conditions doesn't make it a regular occurrence or even likely. So, yeah, and the terms and conditions too would only be applicable to the person that's using ChatGPT. Yeah, it can't stop a third party from suing ChatGPT because they have no right. They didn't agree to those terms and conditions. Right. Yeah, very good questions. Very very on point questions, and we're gonna hit on some of this stuff. And I'm gonna speed up a little bit here because now we've actually talked about a lot of this stuff. Um, ownership of outputs, you know, that's that's the big time issue. It's all all over the news. Who can own the output? Uh, can anybody own the output? If anybody does, is it the user? Is it the AI provider that trained the model? Is it, we've actually had some people that try to claim the machine itself is on like the machine version of PETA. People want the machines that have rights. So it's getting very uh, convoluted and, and the answers are unclear. And again, we just talked about infringement. Um, you know, these outputs can very possibly infringe um, the materials that were used to train the model. So OpenAI, MidJourney, they go onto the web, they scrape data, amount of data that we can't even comprehend. They just rip it off the website, all the data in the world to train these models for whatever their particular use is. And now it's very possible uh, that that's copyright infringement. It's all not clear because they're also arguing, hey, this is fair use. Uh, fair use is a topic in and of itself. People have written books on fair use. It's basically a defense to copyright infringement saying, hey, and basically, it's better for the world. It benefits the world. It's an exception to copyright infringement. The AI folks are arguing fair use. The artists and content producers are arguing infringement. And we'll eventually have some guidelines. And I think at the end of the day, even if one case is decided one way, that's that's only that's going to be one data point. There are going to be cases everywhere. And it'll end up being very fact-specific. So this will be a 5, 10, 20-year issue to develop some sort of general guidelines. Uh, shifting gear slightly, legal issues for an AI user is dependency. I mean, if you're using AI, think of like a classic SaaS service as a customer, just classic SLA issues. If I'm using this, if I'm using Copilot as a core functionality to write my, my software product, uh, what if it goes down? What if the AI vendor goes bankrupt? Copilot, maybe not so much. They have obviously some pretty serious investors, but a lot of these AI providers are startups. They could go belly up tomorrow. Then you might have code that was written by a uh, co-pilot or another provider. You have no internal expert that support, that's supposed to know what's going on and provide maintenance support on this code that was written by an AI vendor that's no longer there. Things to just think about. Um, in the interest of time, I'll probably speed through this. This is AI provider. So if you're actually an AI company that's providing an AI service, issues to think through, all very similar. Um, Trying to think of ones that might be unique. We'll get to compliance in a second. The training data issue is the big one right now. That's actually percolating in the news. Uh, we'll all have a couple examples, but they're basically scraping the web. You have books, images, poems, like everything in the world you can possibly think of. They are just ripping that off to train their AI models. And the big question is, are they are they breaching contracts in terms of use? Are they infringing copyrights? There's a whole other subset of laws they might be violating if they're doing that. That's the question. Nobody knows really the answer to that. Here's a couple ones that are just in the news. Sarah Silverman just the other day. I'm a, this potentially could even turn into a class action with a bunch of other folks suing a, OpenAI and Meta for copyright infringement because they took her stand up and her jokes, et cetera, use it to train their model. Um, and then here's another open AI hit with a class action over unprecedented, in quotes, web scraping. Again, just scraping every the amount of data uh, that these companies are using to train these models are 
some of them I heard are like 175 billion columns long. These are the these are the size of the data sets they're using. An interesting problem is the ethics behind AI. The, there's a classic thought experiment called the trolley problem. I'll be interested to see what the group thinks. So the example is there's a trolley heading down the road. We're the person right there with the lever. And we have two options. We can do nothing and let the lever hit the five people, or you can switch the lever and it hits the one person. What's the right thing to do? Who thinks you should do nothing? Who thinks you should push the lever? Most people have no idea, like myself. It's a hard question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is actually a classic problem that uh, that the electronic vehicle uh, companies are working through right now. They're making self-driving cars, and they know there will be situation, unfortunately, where a car is in a situation where somebody is going to get hit and likely killed. You know, hopefully you avoid that, but at some point the computer will recognize I have option A and option B, and so I'm going to either hit this car or hit this car or maybe hit this pedestrian. What should the AI algorithm, what should it do? And should it, whose life should it prioritize? Should it prioritize the drivers, the other car, the pedestrian? You know, not easy, not easy questions. This is obviously kind of an extreme example of ethics in AI with electronic vehicles. There's a lot more or less extreme examples. And these are these aren't super easy questions to answer. There's a news article about that, trying to figure out this thought experiment that's now coming to life. Isn't this really about trying to pass off our ethical responsibilities on the AI? Like the trolley problem really frames up the potential for people to try to push tough decisions on the AI and let it make the decision so that it might reduce their liability and introduce this sort of complexity into the situation where your lawyer might help you win. That's what I see. They're going to find someone to sue. Yeah, and, and, well, there's arguments. I agree with all of that, but there's also arguments to be made. If we can come to a uniform decision on this, we would probably save more lives because the computer and EVs can act quickly. So long as there's a mutual understanding on what the rules should be, which is hard to do. <laughs> but the beauty and the ugliness of this trolley problem is that it's framed by intellectuals to decrease the options to only two. And in reality, the AI doesn't have that. They will never have that. There are always two options. I agree. It'll be more complex. This is a simplified version. But the cars, you know, will find themselves in situations where there's danger. So, so it obfuscates the decision-making process, and it reduces the liability of people to be responsible for making this other than. Doctors have this same, <clears throat> you know, it's already well, well, you know, established in medicine. Doctors have to make those type of decisions yeah. all the time. So I assume they'll just follow what's already in practice. And mm -hmm. Doctors also, as they, at least in America, they push the decision on the patient, the person who doesn't have any information to make the decision. Like in the surgical room, room, they don't have the time. They're, they're like down, down there. It's making direction, but the control is supposed to cases. Yeah, it's an interesting question. One could argue uh you're not getting rid of the decision, you're just changing who's making it. Someone who's in a panic behind the wheel or companies that are thinking through this more fully. I don't, that's just one perspective you could have. I'm not saying you're wrong. It's just one counterpoint. Well, so I think that driving this car, I mean, so this is a very real thing. But, um, but I believe that driving this car will reach a point where they will pervasively reach, right? Let's say tens of thousands of cars. Right now, there's, there's like 45,000 people are that's in the United States every year. This is likely to get one more continuously, right? And so uh, I believe that if you have that, and this, this is just around the corner, really, that the technology side of this, I believe that uh, this part of the use that to have uh, like a fraction of what's happening right now. I tend to agree, but you also have a huge adoption period that could be 100 years. Right, but yeah. so now you have, this, you have this trolley problem, right? Where, it's a, you can decide, you can have the person with the cell phone drive people, right, or drunk. And I, mm -hmm. I have people that I know that die from the contract and they don't die. So very real, I think, it is you. And you say, you have an AI that will do a fraction of this. Yeah. And maybe you can create the stop, right? There's something that a human would never do, but it's a fraction. So I, I, I mean, I'm a computer scientist, so I, I think about it. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I think if there is universal adoption, which these cars are going to be very expensive, so that is a long, long time down the road, I would think. You know, you still have people, you still see, you know, 1980s cars out there, you know, and we have electronic vehicles now for a while. It's not close to universal adoption, but at some point there probably will be close to universal adoption where I agree that, and as so long as there's kind of uniformity and they're making the programming, the electronic vehicles on the same principles, it should reduce the deaths. I, in my opinion, I agree by quite a bit. And that's also an opportunity. I'm not saying it's necessarily right or wrong, but at least in this situation, in real life, and you're in a car and you're about to hit two people and you have a millisecond to decide, you're not making a rational decision. You're just reacting randomly and pulling the steering wheel and God knows what happens. This would allow you to at least make a rational decision. Yeah. You might end up saying you just want to let it go. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now we're getting close to time here. Uh, let me see here. Laws and regulations, just know there are actually current laws there that regulate AI indirectly, though. Most of these laws, except for a few brand new ones, New York City just passed one. Most laws weren't uh, enacted and passed with AI in mind. They're very old law, not necessarily very old, but they're old concepts, old laws that we're now trying to apply to AI. And it's not always super easy. So you have IP rights, the big one. Uh, the DMCA, also an intellectual property right, copyright act, very similar. Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, a lot of people are using that for this web scraping. They're saying, hey, you know, there's a provision, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, that has teeth trying to go after these uh, companies that are scraping their data. State data privacy laws now, you know, you're pumping a bunch of personal information, these things, you got to be careful. FTC is very active under the Biden administration. You've probably seen that in a lot of different contexts, not competes, everything. They also have AI in their crosshairs. Um, the future, the new laws and regulations will come, not might. That's a, that's a guarantee. Um, Congress in the U.S. thinks they missed the boat on regulating a lot of aspects of technology, social media. They basically come out and said, we acted too slowly. And once the cat's out of the bag, it's really hard to rein it back in. And they are, I think uh, it was Chuck Schumer, I believe, that said that just out in the open. Like they are, they don't want to miss the boat on AI. Um, so they are going to, they are going to try to pass stuff. And I'm sure they will. Um, what, what is it? What does it do? Remains to be seen. In Europe, they have a, they have a EUIA act that's actually pretty far along. It's not ne necessarily passed, but it's pretty far along in the process. It will be enacted pretty soon. Typical in Europe, similar uh, to GDPR. It's very paternalistic. It's very, pretty arduous. It's risk-based depending on the, what your use of AI is. As you do it, more risky use, there's a lot more restrictions. I think people in the U.S. hope uh, that the U.S. is less, less uh, paternalistic, less strict than the EU. And then what to do about all this? I always say, like, I always advise fans, like, don't avoid uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning because there's some risks out there. There's always going to be risks, but just understand them account for them, understand what you're getting yourself into, um, know the basics of AI. Um, like I said, I feel like I have a pretty decent understanding about it. I'm not a computer scientist, but I just devoted a little bit of time to researching it. At least now I know the basics where if I was a customer and an AI service provider come to me, I'd be able to ask some fairly educated questions and get some answers. You know, how'd you train your model? What data did you use? Are, is there, if I'm using it as a software program, are you going to give me a bunch of open source of code that now risks my entire proprietary product? Um, things like that. So just don't run away from it. Just become educated and uh, do your diligence. Um, along those lines, I'd have an AI usage policy, very similar, like a security policy. Um, you know, just purpose and scope. Can employees use it? Some companies have gone so far as to say, Complete ban, don't use it at all. I think that's pretty uh, risk averse. Uh, maybe some companies do that in the short term while they try to figure it out. But you definitely uh, want to make sure, like, for example, a law firm, we wouldn't want a bunch of young attorneys pumping in client confidential information to chat GBT. You know, it's like yeah, you want to make sure you got a policy and let them know, hey, don't do that. There's risks out there. So um, there's a lot of other aspects of the policy you should consider. Um, and again, a policy that just sits on the shelf is worthless, actually. Review it, actually enact it, actually educate your employees on it. And that's that. So thank you.